Namaste. At the Swadeshi Indology Conference 3 held in IIT Madras, the chief guest was Dr. Ramachandran, famous neuroscientist. Here is his talk. Please watch. Both Tamil and Sanskrit, you need a brain. <laughs> They're very sophisticated languages. And you need a brain to, to understand the grammar and grammatical structure and, and even be able to speak. You take it for granted, but extraordinary achievement, human language. And uh, as I said, I'm pleased to be here, and especially at Rajiv's invitation, because he has pioneered many of the current resurgence of interest in Indology, Sanskrit, and uh, has become an enfant terrible in, the, in this domain, and an, an effective antidote to the Anglophile uh, cafe intellectuals who populate some of our campuses. <laughs> Brain is a lump of jelly, 1.5 kilograms, made up of 100 billion nerve cells. Each nerve cell can be active, inactive, and uh, makes contact with other nerve cells at points called synapses. Synapses can be inhibition, excitation. Based on this, people have calculated that the number of possible brain states, number of possible permutations and combinations of brain activity, exceeds the number of elementary particles in the universe, in the entire cosmos. This gives you some idea of the staggering comp complexity we're dealing with when studying the human brain, this lump of jelly. How do you study it? Well, one, one approach is to look at lesions in different parts of the brain, small lesion caused by a stroke or a tumor, this damages a small part of the brain. What you get is often not a, a complete blunting of all your mental capacity. What you get is selective loss of one specific function with all other functions being preserved. So you get a person who is completely intelligent, norm, articulate, fluent, emotionally intact, but has a problem with memory alone. So then you say, where is the lesion? It's there in the hippocampus. That's where memory is. Let's go and look for memory in that region of the brain. This is the strategy we've been using for over 100 years. It's called behavioral neurology or cognitive neuroscience. Look for people with pa patients with damage to a small part of the brain, ask what the deficit is, how you can treat the patient, help the patient, how you can understand the functions of the normal brain by studying the pa people with the d damage and changes in behavior. Is that clear? Yeah. Let me give you a few examples. Extraordinary disease called Capgras syndrome. Capgras, okay, I'll explain that. You see here a slide of the human brain. This is just to give you a rough idea. There is, I'm sorry, there are three slides. I can't go back and forth in all three, but that, that's the, there's the front of the brain called frontal lobe, temporal lobe here, occipital for vision, temporal for hearing, frontal lobe for judgment and foresight. So you don't need to remember all this. Just roughly I'm going, going over the surface of the brain. In the temporal lobe, and tucked away in the, inside it, in the middle, is a small structure called the fusiform gyrus. And this gyrus is involved in recognizing objects, and especially recognizing people's faces. If you damage the fusiform gyrus, a person loses the ability to recognize people's faces, even his mother, his father, even himself in the mirror. If the doctor that looks like that, that sort of, I can't see what it is, it looks like a person, but I don't know it's me. I know it's me because when I move my head, it moves. When I wink, it moves, it winks, the mirror image winks. Therefore, it must be me, but it doesn't look like me. Now, that's because the face area in the brain is damaged. So far, so far, so good, right? If, I, if I'm going too fast, just, just cough or stop me. Now, what happens is that the, there is another disorder which is very, very rare, much more rare than, than prosopognosia, which is face blindness. This is called Capgras syndrome, C-A-P-G-R-A-S, Capgras syndrome. What it refers to is if somebody had a head injury or a tumor, damaged a part of the brain, comes out of coma and he seems perfectly normal, articulate, fluent, intelligent, can do crossword puzzles, math, everything, right? Discuss politics. But then he looks at you and he says, you're my doctor, and he looks, 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 at, looks at his wife. He says, doctor, that's not my wife. There's some strange woman pretending to be my wife. He looks at his mother, and he says, that's not my mother. She's an imposter, some strange woman pretending to be my mother. Now, think about this. Your mother is absolutely vital to your, your existence, especially in, here in India. And uh, this guy is looking at his mother and says, this woman looks like my mother, but she's not my mother. She's an imposter. Now, people thought that these guys were crazy, obviously, that some psychiatric problem, but there's no, no, no other psychosis. The person is completely mentally lucid, discuss politics, discuss chemistry, discuss calculus, discuss art, whatever you want. When it comes to his mother, he gets delusional. He says, that's not my mother, that's some strange woman. Now, the standard explanation is Freudian. By the way, some of these pseudo-intellectual scholars all over campuses in India you keep invoking Freud for everything. Ganesh and uh, Parvati is something to do with Freud and... and 
This is complete public nonsense, I can tell you that. Take my word for it. Okay, you, you, can just, just, you can just discard it wholesale. Just throw it in the waste paper basket. Donegar and all this stuff, it's all complete nonsense, right? Okay, now let's, coming back to, uh, to uh, the Freudian account, the Freudian theory of Capgras syndrome is the following. Each of us has the visual image. Visual image goes to the back of the brain first, where you process the features, color, orientation, edges, motion, the elementary attributes of visual processing are processed in area 17, visual cortex. Then the higher attributes are processed, such as is it a face, is it a dog, is it a pig? The fusiform gyrus, which is not shown here, but it's tucked away here. So you identify the object. Is it a pig or a dog, or is it Joe, or is it Diane, or whoever, right? So you identify the person. But the emotions are not evoked here. You just identify the person, and you say this is so-and-so. So you pigeonhole the person, but no emotion. Then the message goes to the limbic system, which is the emotional core of the brain. From the visual processing centers, you identify the object, you identify the person, but there's no emotions. Then it goes to the limbic system, and then the amygdala, and then there is powerful emotion involved. This is just some male man, I don't care about it, you know. This is my mother, my God, I better perk up. This is a dean, I would pay attention, right? So this, this assigning a value to what you're looking at is done by the connection from the visual centers to the limbic system. Is that clear? Vision to emotion, there's a wire that goes, that takes information from vision to emotion. There are many wires and many centers, but I'm simplifying it. What happens in this guy is that wire is cut. So when he looks at his fusiform gyrus is intact, unlike the previous disorder, where you can't recognize the face, there the fusiform itself is damaged, so you, you can't even recognize people. Here he can recognize his mother, he can recognize his father, but the wire that goes to emotion is, is cut. So he says, my God, if this is my mother, why is it I don't experience any warmth or terror, as the case may be? <laughs> why is it I'm, I'm, I'm not feeling anything? So this must be some other strange woman. She's an imposter. Doesn't make any sense to you and me. It's inconceivable that somebody should not have emotions with the mother. But with the connection gone, that's his experience. And he therefore kicks into this delusion, saying, this cannot be my mother. It's some other imposter, some woman pretending to be my mother. Extraordinary delusion. And the Freudian explanation is very different. Freudian explanation is that all babies, male and female, but I'll just talk about the male, the male have a sexual attraction to the mother. It's like Wendy Doniger like argument. <laughs> you, you, there was sexual attraction to the mother when they were babies. And then what happens is that when the baby develops, the brain develops, cortex develops, inhibits this latent sexual urges. So you and I, when you look at your mother, you don't get sexually aroused, according to Freud. But then if the blow to the head comes, you know, this is called Oedipus complex of Freud, right? You all know about this. Blow comes to the head, the cortex is damaged, the inhibition is removed. And suddenly and inexplicably, you find yourself sexually aroused by looking at your mother. You say, my God, if this is my mother, why am I sexually aroused? This has to be some other woman. Very strange, complicated line of reasoning. Very ingenious, but wrong. As is all Freudian, you know, saying elef Ganesha's trunk is an elf, is a phallic symbol and all that. With all, all Freudian explanations have this character. You know, they're, they're often ingenious and clever, but usually wrong, Al always wrong. So what I'm saying is this has nothing to do with, uh, with Freud or, or, because I later came, came across the same syndrome in a patient looking at his pet poodle and denying all saying, this is not my pet poodle, this is not Fifi, it's some other poodle pretending to be my poodle. <laughs> now you try to invoke the Freudian explanation. <laughs> you have to say it's a latent bestiality in all humans. You're all attracted to poodles, but this particular, something like that. <laughs> doesn't hold water, so we said this is nonsense. What's gone wrong is there's a disconnection between vision and emotion by the accident. So we tested this in a lab, a very simple experiments. You put two electrodes on the skin, measure the sweating, measures your emotional response to what you're looking at. If you take a normal person and you show him tables and chairs and shoes, no emotional response, no sweating, right? But if you show him a picture of the mother, he starts sweating, and you measure the change in resistance. Everybody here, if I show you a picture of your mother, you start sweating, believe it or not. And you measure it, change in resistance, and you say emotional response. What about this chap with Capgras syndrome? You show him shoes and tables and chairs, there's no response. Of course, you don't get emotionally attached to your shoe, unless you have a shoe fetish, it's a different matter. But if you show him his mother's picture, there's no response. The emotional response to his mother doesn't exist. So this means we are on the right track. This lack of emotional response is what leads to the disorder. It's been confirmed by many laboratories since we just described this. And the reason I find it fascinating is the patient goes to the next door, 
The mother calls from, the mother comes and the patient says, you're not my mother, why do you keep following me? She goes to the adjacent room and she phones him, 10 minutes later, and he picks up the phone. She says, is this Johnny? Says, yeah, mom, where are you? Where, where have you been all these days? I've been looking for you. There's a strange woman here who keeps claiming she's you. In the phone, there is no delusion. Completely normal. She walks in 10 minutes later. She says, who are you? You look just like my mother. Now, how do you explain that? It turns out there's a separate wire going from the auditory cortex, from the hearing center of the brain, to the emotional centers. Different from the visual input. So in him, the visual input is disconnected. So there's no emotions evoked by vision. But when he hears the voice of the mother, it goes to the auditory cortex in the top. And then from there, cascades into the limbic system, the emotion center. So you get the appropriate emotion. And you say, my god, my mom is back. It's wonderful. This shows the guy is not crazy. Or maybe it shows he's crazy. But how can a person on the phone say he's an imposter, he's my mother, when he sees that, he says he's an imposter? The only way you can explain that is in terms of anatomy, and I've done that. So here's an example of a, of a bizarre, seemingly incomprehensible neuropsychiatric syndrome, which you can reject the Freudian view and do some simple experiments and show in one hour what's gone wrong in the brain and learn something about normal human brain and behavior, about our interactions with our parents or whatever. You learn all that studying this. Even more mysterious, these patients, some of them will look at themselves the patient looking at himself in the mirror, that's not me, there's somebody pretending to be me. Here's a, bear in mind, all these disorders, they're completely normal in other respects. That's critical. They're not completely crazy and, you know, the impression people get is, I'm talking about crazy people, no. Perfectly normal, intellectually normal, emotionally intact, not disturbed mentally, fluent in conversation, understand poetry, understand politics, everything. But when it comes to his mother, he gets his delusion. So the selective nature of the delusion gives you confidence that this area is somehow involved in that function. It's not some just blunting of your cognition, but a highly selective loss, specific structures in the brain involved in facial recognition, emotion, and all of that. And surely it's also involved in, as I said, dupl he duplicates himself. That man is not David, it's not me, it's another David pretending to be me. Now look, look at this, some completely normal guy, in other respects, telling you that mirror reflection is not me, another person pretending to be me. Then he looks, another direction looks slightly, and he said, oh, that's another third David. Now, what's going on here is very interesting. You see, all of us, when we collect, we acquire new memories. You see, Rajiv, first time I saw him in, in San Diego, he came to talk to me, and uh, unex suddenly we, we were doing an interview, which is fine, went well. Yeah. Then we did the interview, and then I have a model of him, and I have, have a file in my computer of Rajiv. Then I encountered him in another context, as a, as a, as a father. Then I put, add to the file, enrich the file. Then I see him in IIT, enrich the file. So you create a file for a person. So this becomes more and more rich and meaningful for me. Same with yourself, Vizya, right? So with Diane, you, know, you get more and more rich, meaningful connection, and you create object files. This guy does not do that. He creates an object file, and there's a change. He says there's a new Malhotra, another guy, not the same guy. When I see him in the hall later, he's a third Malhotra. So this basic process of linking memories together to create new categories. That's missing in this patient. And, and the notion of selfhood. I said, you're saying another patient. That guy is a real David in the mirror. I am an imposter. I'm not real. Now, guy is intelligent. How can, you, how can you make a statement like this? I said, can you explain to me what you mean when you say you're not real? You're standing, you're talking to me. What do you mean you're not real? And that, what do you mean that's a real David in the mirror? He says, look, I've I've been tortured by this idea for months now. I've been thinking about this for years. How can I be unreal, not the real David, and that guy be the real David? I have the answer. When we were twins, we were born as twins. I had a twin brother when I was born, very young. And the two babies were interchanged in the cradle. And that guy went up there, the real me went there, and I'm here. I'm that guy. So some sort of co complicated but ingenious explanation he comes up with to account for this, for this um, dilemma he's in. Okay, so before I continue, let me. This is, this is what we do. We study strange syndromes and ask questions about the basic brain function. And, and can you answer questions about brain function? Can you treat the patient? We'll get to that in a minute. People ask me, how do you find these cases? Are they rare? Some of them are rare. Capgras is rare. Some of them are very common. Phantom limb is very common. And this, we reach a point when somebody has a strange disorder anywhere in the world, they phone me. 
And they say, would you like, can, can you give us your opinion? And the patient flies over, and we, we see the patient, and give, give, sometimes solve the case. Nine out of the 10 times, it's a false alarm. You don't hear about the success, failures. You only hear about the success story. You think, I keep doing this, but we don't. And there are many bogus syndromes in neurology, neuropsychiatry. Described syndromes in textbooks of psychiatry, which don't exist. Just to make the psychiatrist want to become famous, so you create a syndrome. I mean, that's putting it too crudely, but something like that. Let me give you two or three examples of this. One is Duclaremboll syndrome. How many of you know about Duclaremboll syndrome? A syndrome simply means a set of cluster of symptoms with a common cause. And you, sometimes you have syndrome which is inexplicable. But Duclaremboll syndrome, look it up later, refers to a syndrome, believe it or not, where a young lady develops a delusional fixation that an old, rich, famous man is madly in love with her, but is in denial about it. <laughs> now, this, this seemed crazy to me. And ironically, the converse of the syndrome, where an old, aging man develops a delusion that the young hottie is in love with him, but is in denial about it, <laughs> has not been described, because there's no female psychiatrist. And that's much more common, I can assure you. <laughs> so forget about declarable syndrome. That's clearly nonsense. There's also chronic underachievement syndrome. Believe it or not, you go and look at DSM. Syndrome, the name of a syndrome is chronic underachievement syndrome. We used to call it stupidity in my day. <laughs> so it's got a name, chronic underachievement. Third syndrome I'll tell you about, which is even the best one. Third syndrome, oppositional defiant disorder. <laughs> oppositional defiant disorder is when a spirited youngster dares to challenge the establishment, challenge his professor, challenge the doctor, challenge his parents, he's got oppositional defiant disorder. Now, the man who invented this disease was a genius, because any attempt by the patient to protest the diagnosis is seen as additional evidence for the diagnosis. <laughs> so you have to be careful. But now and then you get lucky and you, and you, and you make progress. So let me tell you about one other uh, extraordinary observation. I told you about the intricate connections in the, in the limbic system and the visual, visual pathways. Similar system for touch, the intricate brain system for movements of the hand, grabbing something, touching something, pulling something. Motor cortex, commands from the motor cortex go down the spinal cord to the arm. Sensory cortex, touch cortex. And you can see a diagram of the touch pathways in the brain. Um, so that's sort of the two and three, sort of the one, labeled one, the brown strip behind the central sulcus is the touch area in the brain. Where you touch person, cells fire that, okay? That's the touch area of the brain. Now it turns out that you can ask, the touch area, is it, is it formed innately? Is it, is it innately specified, or is it acquired gradually? Is the map. I'm going to show you the map. That's the map of the, obtained by Penfield right, in, in Canada. This is sections of the brain, and you're looking at mapping of the brain, the body surface, hand, body, forehead, lips, tongue. Body, completely, the body is draped on the surface of the brain. Every point in the brain has a corresponding point in the, in the finger or elbow or chest or whatever, okay? And you map that, and then what you find is if you remove the arm, the patient has a phantom limb, a phantom arm. That's it's extraordinary in itself. And if you touch the patient's face, the patient feels it in his phantom arm. Why would that be? It's a mystery for Sherlock Holmes. Why the person who lost his arm completely has a phantom limb, that's in itself a mystery. Then you touch his face, he feels it in his phantom. You get a map of the hand on the face. Why would that be? The reason it turns out, so that shows, that shows the phantom, that shows the map, on the, on the map of the hand on the face. Why do you see that? Now, I want you to look at the diagram carefully. You see it because that area of the hand has been removed by the amputation. The, because of the amputation, there's no signals coming to the hand area. Is that clear? Yeah. Right. So signals coming from the face skin to the face area normally stay there, but they now invade the hand territory, cross wire. Because that area is missing an input, this input from the face skin invades hand territory and activates the neurons there. The brain is fooled into thinking they're touching this phantom hand. And you get a beautiful organized map of the kind I showed you earlier. And it gets better. If you get a phantom itch, sometimes you get an itch in your phantom. How do you scratch a phantom itch? There's no hand there. It's terrible. I mean, it's extraordinary pain, too, in the, in, the, in the phantom. I'll get to that in a minute. He finally scratches his cheek. Because my signal is going to the hand area, this itch gets relieved. The first dis clinical discovery we made. Also, you can do another trick. I'm going to go into detail, but widely publicized. You can go and look at YouTube, TED Talks, you know, all of that. So I'm not going to bore you with repeating it, but just briefly. Many patients with phantom limb will say the phantom limb is fixed in a position, 
It's painful, immobilized. I can't move it. It's excruciating. It's paralyzed. Phantom is paralyzed. It's an oxymoron. How can a phantom be paralyzed? No. We looked at the case sheets, and we found these people had a nerve injury originally. Arm was paralyzed, and then you cut off the arm. So this paralysis of the original arm carries over into the phantom, and it's painful. So I said, why don't you move your hand? Maybe it'll release the pain. He said, I tried to move it. It doesn't move, doctor. It, but it won't budge an inch. I put a mirror in the middle of the box. We thought originally we used virtual reality called IIT, called MIT, and Caltech. They said it would cost a million dollars to set it up. I said, I don't have a million dollars. I'll use one dollar. So with one dollar, we constructed a box, which is seen in the next slide, with a mirror in the middle. You put your phantom on the left side of the mirror. Your phantom is on the left side of the mirror, and your real arm is on the right side. You look at the reflection of the real arm in the mirror. You see the phantom has been resurrected. You get the visual illusion that the phantom has come back, pure Maya. It's not really there. Then when you move your hands symmetrically, you tell them, command both arms to clap or wave goodbye or clench and unclench. He gets the visual illusion that the, that the phantom is moving and clapping and waving goodbye in response to the command. This restores the loop, and astonishingly, he now is able to move his phantom, which he could not prior to the experiment. And he tries it for two or three weeks. He's able to move it freely, and the phantom pain goes away. So for, for, for a $2 mirror, you can cure a patient with phantom limbs. Some patients, about one third of the patients. Now, this has been studied formally by clinicians in, uh, in, in uh, Walter Reed. The data I won't bore you with, with, with the mirror, without, with the placebo, with the plexiglass, no change in the mirror, you get treat, treatment with phantom pain. Another condition I won't bother you with called RSD, where you've got a trivial injury in the hand, but because of the trivial injury, the entire hand sw sw gets swollen. Swollen, painful, red, bone starts atrophying. It becomes four or five times the size sometimes. Look at the hand there. It's about twice the size. This is from small, small injury to a metacarpal bone in your, in your finger. It doesn't heal. It becomes like this. You can treat it with a mirror, with another example. Put a mirror. He moves the dystrophic hand. The swelling goes away as you're watching the mirror. The swelling goes away. Subsides, yeah, right. And, and then and the pain goes away, and it starts moving again. Powerful example of mind-body medicine ha happening right there in front of your eyes. The patient is in tears that his hand is moving for the first time, and swelling is subsiding, right? The data, clinical data, you can go and look it up in the journals. I'm not going to bother with it. Next point I want to make is about mirror neurons. You record from neurons in the brain, they will fire for some, you, somebody touching your hand. Or when you move your fingers, another neuron will fire in the front of the brain. Motor neurons, sensory neurons, right? If I touch, pass in my hand, the neuron will fire and push into the eyes. If I poke somebody with a needle, if you poke me with a needle, a neuron in my insular and anterior singular, you don't know, 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 know the names, but structures in the brain will fire when I poke you with a needle, pain centers. If Rajiv is watching me being poked with a needle, the pain neurons in his brain, which are normally connected to his body, responding to his body being painful, will fire even though nobody's touching him. They're empathy neurons. The neuron is telling my higher centers in the brain, look, the same neuron is firing as would fire if somebody poked you. Therefore, if Rajiv is feeling pain, please be empathetic. The brain signals are interpreted in the brain, and I feel empathy towards it. I feel empathy, but I don't feel the pain. If you poke him with the needle, I don't say, ouch, and withdraw my hand. Right? That would be very confusing. Life would be very confusing. But the reason for that is my skin does not have an input, pain input. So that's vetoing the signal. It's saying, by all means, empathize with Rajiv, but don't dissolve into him. Don't start feeling all his pain, you know, pain and whatever, sensations in heat or whatever. But empathize. So there's a very ingenious circuit here in the brain for empathy minus literally dissolving into them. Now, if you remove the hand, my hand, what will happen? This veto signal goes back to the brain, checking it, is missing. I'll feel your pain. You take a phantom limb pain, and you poke yourself, and he watches. He feels your pain, literally. The only thing separating your mind from another mind, feeling another person's sensations, is your skin. If I remove the skin, you're, you start experiencing Rajiv's pain. Literally. And you withdraw your hand. Out. So that, that hurt. This, this is very much part of our ancient Indian philosophical text, right? The unity of Atman and Brahman. Right. They're all really facets of the same supreme consciousness. I don't want to go, go, go there, but to, for, for experts to deal with. But, but briefly, the, 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 the separation of selves is a convenient make-believe. It's a working assumption we, 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 we need to go about our daily lives. But other than that, there's no real distinction between his mind and my mind, a functional distinction. OK, now how do you put it to use all fine philosophy is fine, but how do you make use of this? It turns out he has excruciating muscular aches and pains in his phantom. 
He can't massage his phantom. He tells his wife, massage my phantom, she thinks he's a fool. <laughs> then he simply watches his wife, massages her, her hand, he feels a massage in his phantom, pain goes away with a phantom massage. Is that clear? Yes. So you watch, 2,000 years of phantom limb research, nobody had observed that. That you can massage another person, watch it, it creates phantom massage in your painful phantom, pain goes away. This is being evaluated clinically, it's not been nailed down yet, but it's been evaluated. I'm going to tell you about another extraordinary phenomenon. This is the name of the game, you know, study strange phenomena and discover how the brain works, right? This is called synesthesia. This is where a person who's otherwise completely normal, 2% of the population, there'll be three or four of you here, or synesthesia, every time you see a number, black and white number, five, six, seven, printed on a sheet of paper, you see a particular color. Five is red, six is blue, seven is chartreuse, eight is indigo, nine is purple. How many of you have this? It's not correlated with intelligence or anything. <laughs> well, you can come and tell me later, but it's usually about two to three people in the audience will have this. They actually see the color. This was discovered in the 19th century by Francis Galton, Charles Darwin's first cousin. People dismissed it, this is nonsense. How can people see colors and they see numbers? It's not nonsense, we have proved it's real. People have suspected that Galton was on the right track. Two out of 50, two out of 100 people, when they see five, six, seven, they see colors. How do you prove it? How do you prove they're not crazy? As I said, sometimes they are crazy, right? So to prove, first of all, he's speaking the truth, the patient's not making it up. How do you do that? The students in my class, two was five, uh, two was red and five was green. Every time they see two is red, five is green. How do you know they, they're seeing colors? They're saying, I'm seeing colors. How do you know that? Well, you, you and I look at it, you don't, you don't, you don't see where the twos are, where the fives are. It looks like a jumble, right? It looks like, like a complete jumble. Is that correct? Okay, now if I do that to you, you say that I see a red triangle. That chap sees a red triangle in this. I see an upside down red triangle, doctor, and I see it much more quickly than you and I could. Which means if he's crazy, how come he's better at it than us? He says, I see a red triangle in that, in that pattern there, right there. Nobody here assume, sees a red triangle there. He sees it and he sees it much faster than you and me. Therefore, he must have a real phenomenon. The colors are being induced by the, by the numbers and the colors can be used as a basis for perceptual processing. Actually, it's really like a driving test for, for color, color, color blindness. It's similar to that, but we're exploiting that principle. Okay, we've shown it's real. So any phenomenon we study, we show it's real, not bogus. Nine out of 10 times, it's not real. One out of 10 times, you succeed, it's a real phenomenon. Then you say, it's a real phenomenon, what's causing it in the brain? So number, step two, what's causing it in the brain? What's going on in the brain? Step three, who gives a damn? You found something, something in the brain, who cares? Right. Well, we care because sometimes you can cure them, it certainly enhances your understanding of the brain function, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna skip ahead. What's going on in the brain? It turns out interfusiform gyrus I already told you about, the number center is in the brain. Right there, the dotted, dotted patch. And the color area is in the red circle, the color area. So you can't see it very clearly, but you can see the dead, dotted green patch, right? That's the color area in the brain. When we present different colors, that area in interfusiform gyrus lights up. The cells that are only sensitive to color, only interested in color. The cells in the, uh, right next to it are interested in numbers, visual shapes of numbers. What is the likelihood that number, color, synesthesia is the most common form of synesthesia, number and color right next to each other, touching each other in the brain? No, there must be cross-wiring, accidental cross-wiring in these people. Why would that be? Well, the reason you get, the, I want to answer the question, who cares? That's very important to all of you. Arcane, neuroanatomy, neurophysiology, who cares about this, right? I'm going to explain, this explains human creativity, metaphor. I'll get to that. Okay, so these, two, these connections are in excess, and therefore every time you see the number, number goes to the number area, and cross activates a color neuron, and the brain, the brain says five is red, six is blue, seven is green, okay. Where do these connections arise? Because in the, in the fetus, everything is connected to everything, believe it or not. Every brain area is connected to every other brain area. The way you create the adult brain is to prune away the excess connections, create modular architecture, each region specialized for different function. The way you create Michelangelo, David, you take a big chunk of rock, as Michelangelo said, remove everything that does not look like David. Then you end up with David, it's as simple as that. Okay, of course it's not that simple, but something like that is going on in the brain, you're removing all the excess neurons, excess connections, you create this, you sculpt the brain, create the modularity. Now supposing that gene that causes the sculpture gets rid of excess connections, is mutated, then you get the, the mutation expressed selectively in the fusiform gyrus, you get the connections remaining there, which should have gone away. Therefore, in the adult brain, these connections are still there between number and color. Every time he sees a number, he sees a color. We did this on, on, on pe people with synesthesia, 
Every time you see the number, the color area lights up. We did it on patients, patients without synesthesia, of course, only, only the number area. You do brain imaging, you can do all of that. Usually we do simple experiments costing $10, $50. Every now and then we do a brain imaging experiment which costs 50K, 100K, because we have to prove to the experts we also do that. Right. Okay, so now, now big question, who cares? You've shown this medical mystery, worthy of Sherlock Holmes, five is red, six is blue. You've shown that it's happening in the brain, where it's happening, why should I care? The reason is, I'll tell you why. The gene is expressed selectively here in the fusiform, you just get number and color. It doesn't help them, except it helps them remember telephone numbers. Your telephone number is 6345397, he says, red, green, blue, 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 yellow, chartreuse. He remembers a chartreuse, a palette of colors, he evokes it when he wants to remember a phone number and he remembers, he's much better at it than us. But that can't be the reason you evolve the this, this system. It turns out if the gene is expressed throughout the brain, throughout the brain, everywhere, you get all the regions connected, hyper, hyper connection between all the different brain regions. Far-flung brain regions are connected to each other. So what? But let me ask you, one of, one of the mysteries in synesthesia is, it's much more common, eight times more common among artists, poets, and novelists, artists, poets, and novelists, than in normal general population. What do artists, poets, and novelists have in common which general people, other people don't have, engineers don't have? Anybody? Artist, poets, and novelists? So creativity, okay. I'll put it more specifically, metaphor. The ability to link seemingly unrelated. If you look at the Nataraja image, Dr. Nagaswamy has written extensively about this. It's pregnant with the metaphor. I mean, every little nuance, every little structure that has some metaphorical significance, you know, which, which you, you need like Anand Kumar Swami or somebody to explain to you, but even, you don't even need an explanation. The brain resonates as soon as you see it. So you get a metaphor in art, in literature you get a metaphor, it is the East and Juliet is the Sun. You don't say Juliet is the sun, that means it's a glowing ball of fire. No, of course, schizophrenia, you say that by the way. You take metaphors literally, but normal people say, Juliet is the sun, she's warm like the sun, radiant like the sun, rises in bed like the sun rises in the east, center of my solar system, like the sun is center of the solar system. Any number of metaphorical links. Shakespeare, of course, was a master of this. Master of metaphor, and I bet he had synesthesia. Right? So, if, so what I'm saying is if ideas, are also localized in different parts of the brain, like young lady, son, metaphor. The excess connections create a propensity to link seemingly unrelated ideas in far-flung brain regions, which is what makes them creative. They see links which you and I can't see. It makes them extraordinarily creative. So this is the basis, the neural basis of creativity. For example, if I were to say, overdo something. Something I would ask you to give me a metaphor for overdoing something. Can you give me an example? Don't worry, most people don't get it, but over overdoing something. Okay, anybody? Eating, eating. eating, you can overdo eating, but I'm saying a metaphor for, okay, I'll give you an example. To add another hue to the rainbow, to smooth the ice, to gild refined gold, to throw perfume on the violet, is wasteful and ridiculous excess. I didn't say that. Shakespeare did. If you're struggling here for one metaphor, he says to add another hue to the rainbow, throw perfume on the violet, to smooth the ice, to gill refined gold, is, is wasteful and ridiculous. How do you think of that in, in just one? You didn't sit that way all day and say, what shall I say? You know, perfume on the violet, perfume on the violet. <laughs> this is because there's connections in the brain. This is what makes it more, I think, makes it more metaphorical. Okay. If you talk about creativity and metaphor, now you, you, the final question you're going to ask is, why, why don't we all have this ability, this excess connection? If it's so good for you, why don't, why, you know, we, we, can, we can write well, but not as well as Shakespeare, right? Why don't all of us have these extra connections? The answer is we don't want everybody to be poetic and creative. If you're a neurosurgeon is doing surgery on your brain, you don't want him getting metaphorical on you. <laughs> you need people who think like engineers, you know, very precise, that sort of thing. And you also need people who are wide ranging and roaming the landscape. So this gen heterogeneity of the gene pool is ensured by making sure that not everybody is okay. So where does that get us? Last, last point I want to make, very interesting, I was with Francis Galton. It's called a calendar line. All of, all of you have a calendar in your mind. You can see people looking at their watches to see I'm exceeding my time. I'll be finished in two minutes. Calendar line, we all have. In other words, when I ask somebody to imagine a calendar, visualize a calendar in front of you, you're a good subject. The annual calendar, can you describe it for me? What is your annual calendar? If you visualize it in front of you, what does it look like? You're a bad subject because you, you're one of the... <laughs> You're a person with a calendar syndrome. <laughs> most people, the exceptions, I'd like to see them later. Most people see a left top is January, 
Bottom right is December. January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Like a, like a rectangular thing. It's very vague, not very clear to me. Calendar synesthes, maybe like you, you're maybe halfway there. We'll see the actual letters of the alphabet, M-A-Y, May, J-U, and in front of them, printed in front of them, often not a rectangular shape, but a L shape, or a shape like a horizontal hula hoop. I have several patients. They have a hoop in front of their chest, January, February, March, April, May, June, August, September. You've seen this many people, and they say, I'm, I can see J-U-N-E, J -U -N -E. it's J-U-N-E, it's, 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 what is that common font, Arial? Arial font, J-U-N-E, it's this big, they'll describe it for you. And people say, this guy must be crazy. What do you mean the Arial font, circle hoop? There's nothing there, there's nothing all in the mind. He says, I'm not crazy, I know it's not in, in front of me, but I can see it. How do you know you're not making it up? People have been trying for 50 years, 100 years since Galton, so these people are not crying for attention, they're making up some story, like I'm seeing a calendar here. First of all, why should different people Different cultures make up the same story, so it doesn't make any sense. But assume it's true, how do you prove directly that these people are seeing a calendar in front of their eyes, like a hula hoop, an L shape, a rectangle, a parallelogram, with all the months marked out, how do they see it? How do you prove it? We did, we did an experiment which took five minutes instead of 50 years. We said, I want you to name the calendar months for me aloud. January, February, March, April, May, June, we can all do that. Name alternate months aloud. January, March, May, July, we can do that. A little bit slowed down. Name it backwards. We're terrible at it. It takes three, four times as much time. I won't ask you about March, January, I'm, I'm slow. It takes three times as much time because you don't, you're doing it from a, a memory. These people going forward, backward, do it just as fast because they're seeing it in front of them. If I give you a printed calendar, no matter how bad you are, if I, if I say read it, you read it backwards or forward, it doesn't matter. It'll be just as fast. They're just as fast reading forward, backward, very fast, as fast as you and I read forward. This proves in a five-minute experiment that this phenomenon is real. They have people have, some people have constructed a calendar. Next question, what part of the brain is involved? These are all many examples, by the way. Calendar line. Okay, there is a structure called angular gyrus in the left hemisphere. Angular gyrus in the left hemisphere is a small structure the size of my finger. It's involved in counting. Involved in sequence, months of the year, days of the week. And it, we think it's messed up in, in dyslexia. We'll talk about that in a future lecture, maybe. That area is involved in sequencing because the brain could not develop a math module in the brain. Because math evolved only about 10,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, in India, by the way. So, uh, so math evolved in India and was systematized by, you know, Baksali manuscript and all that, Aryabhatta, Paskara, it was systematized. But it evolved in a specific region of the brain, angular gyrus. And you cannot develop a new algorithm. In evolution, you can't start from scratch and evolve a completely new algorithm. You had to use pre-existing structure and build on it. It's called kludes or hacking or whatever, you know, kludes or taking advantage of pre-existing structures. So this structure is involved in, in sequencing. The brain had to map sequences of time, and, but you can't do that because there's no representation of time in the brain. So let me represent time on space, like we do in a graph paper, in a clock. There's a piece of cortex here. I'm going to represent time, weeks, months in space because the brain has thousands, hundreds of maps for space, the way it evolved in, in fish and amphibians. So it cannot start developing a special algorithm for time. So let me map it onto space. Okay, map it on. Now, if that map is the basis for the calendar, if that map gets messed up or strengthened, you get this phenomenon. So where is that? I'm showing you here the, the structure called the angular gyrus on the top. The angular gyrus is in upper temporal lobe and it's doing sequences. There's a fiber going from, you can dissect it with a knife. There's a fiber called the inferior longitudinal fasciculus which goes from that to the hippocampus, involved in memory, for place, location, all of that. So we said this band of fibers is your calendar. That's where your calendar is, and that band of fibers is strengthened by genes in these people for some reason. So they have a heightened calendar, they actually see it, they can go backwards, forward, any of that stuff. So what, what we've done here is we've taken many, many problems which look like puzzles, in, insoluble problems, calendar, phantom pain, uh, and, and I talked earlier about Capgras syndrome. In some cases, develop treatments for them. Some cases, at least, interest our understanding. Because you, what would you talk about yourself? What do you mean by self? Major preoccupation in Indian philosophy, for Greek philosophy. You talk about self, many attributes, continuity of time, embodiment, you're in this body, and I showed you that that can be mistaken. The temporary association with your body, the sense of self, uh, continuity in time, memories, memories of a lifetime, 
Unity, you've got many sensory, in sensory inputs, many memories, but you feel like one person. Unity of consciousness, where does it come about? Studying patients like Capgras syndrome, studying these people who have calendars. Your calendar is very much a part of yourself. I'm going to go back to, to the car after the lecture, go somewhere else. I'm going to do this today. The day after tomorrow, I'm going to Bangalore. A few months later, I'm going to go to California. We all have calendars. It very, culture plays a tremendous role, of course, in the calendar. Germans have a very profound, strong connection to that. I'm predicting. Very, very strong calendars. You go to an Italian or an Indian, it's all over the place. This is a prediction. I'm not sure of this. But the basic scaffolding is that innate, innately specified. But the expression of the calendar varies from culture to culture. I want to say one final point. This is all relevant to C.P. Snow's point, which he made many years ago in his read lectures. C.P. Snow said in his lectures on BBC, the two cultures in the world, all scholars, the science, sciences, and the humanities. Scientists are Philistines, they have no interest in arts, humanities, and all that. The scholars in the humanities have no interest in arts, and science is all reductionist, waste of time. He said, never the twain shall meet. The arts, the humanities, and the sciences. I'm saying the twain shall meet, that's what you're seeing here. And they meet in the human brain. There's an interface between culture and uh, effects of culture, and, all, and science, where science and humanities meet. So this allows you to defy C.P. Snow. And to answer many of these questions which philosophers have been preoccupied, preoccupied with for, for centuries. Question of self, of selfhood, question of even aesthetics we've studied, I don't have time to go into it. Capgras patients with this disconnection between vision and emotion, they'll see, they'll see the painting and they'll say, doctor, this painting used to be so vivid for me, so meaningful. Now I look at the painting, I look at the sculpture, they leave me completely unmoved. And I, technically I understand it, but there's no meaning for me. That essential element which we call meaning is gone. That's what the Capgra patients are. Those circuits are involved in understanding the meaning of art. Maybe rasa is, is gone. Music, they're still in tune with, fine, because separate pathway. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. I have two hats. The question is about memories from previous births, yes. reincarnation. Yes. If I wear my scientist hat, I'll say the evidence is not very compelling. Not compelling. If you go and look carefully, there's always some flaw in the argument or some evidence missing, not, never been clearly demonstrated. If I wear my more human, <laughs> human hat, if you have an open mind, maybe there's something to it, maybe there's something to reincarnation, all of that, go look at the cases, keep an open mind. But the evidence has to be very clearly documented. So the answer is, we don't, we don't even know if it's real before, before we can answer whether it, how it's done. Right? Good question. Very, very, very good question. And in fact, the answer is that certainly many drugs, LSD, maybe part as well, but LSD for sure, create synesthetic experiences in otherwise normal people, in some people who are predisposed, not in everybody. So that makes it more interesting. Why would some chemicals induce synesthesia? It's because you have the propensity, but not the full connections, and it changes the dynamics and causes you to experience this cross-cross wiring and you start, start seeing colors. And I think it's really true that the drugs produce synesthesia because it's much more common in IIT than Stanley Medical College. <laughs> I'm sorry? I was in Jipmer, sir, next door. You were in Jipmer? That's even worse. Or even better, I should say. <laughs> you say, well, what about out-of-body experiences? Well, if you, if you stimulate certain regions of the brain, like right, right frontal parietal, <coughs> patient will describe himself hovering above and watching himself. But this doesn't mean that the soul has gone there and watching. The brain, you yourself can do this. When I'm giving a lecture this morning, I was driving up, I was imagining myself, watching myself, pacing on the podium and giving a lecture. You rehearse it, you temporarily detach yourself, your point of view, your optical point of view, and watch yourself performing. Now, how this is done, we don't know. But doesn't, you don't have to invoke a soul for that. It's a, it's a mechanism in the brain to allow you to, what you call an allocentric view of yourself instead of an egocentric, right? But, but going on to that, you can produce illusions of this kind with just optics. My student, Eric Altshula, who's a neurologist, put a mirror, and you can try this at home, a chain of mirrors 
Or, so you get multiple reflections of yourself. Okay, it's easy to do. Or you can get a convex mirror where you look upside down. You look in a convex mirror from a distance. You see an upside down Lilliputian shrunk image of yourself hanging from the ceiling. If you now move your body, that chap is an out of body. He feels like you're not you. Why is he mimicking me? There's another guy is mimicking me. You don't get that with a regular mirror, but you're used to it. Here you get this uncanny impression that you've left your body, you're know, walking over there, or that person is, is, is another person, not me, looking at me. He looks like me, but he's watching me and imitating me. So you can produce through optical means or video, 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 video cameras temporary out of body experiences. And there are neural structures in the brain that allow you to do this, including mirror neurons. Well, if somebody dies, there's no neural activity, so, so you can't have this out of body experience. But who knows, right? <laughs> I haven't done it myself, so I don't know. So I have. That'd be the ultimate sacrifice for science. I don't know much about that, I won't speculate, but roughly speaking, temporal lobe, temporal lobe epilepsy, people with temporal lobe seizures in the size of the brain often have intense religious experiences. And when you look for them, religious icons, they've got a big galvanic skin response, you know, the sweating response, huge response they get. Whereas with regular people, they get a normal response, not huge, they get off scale. So we postulated that, that maybe the temporal lobes in the brain, the circuits in the brain, whose activity predisposes you to religious experience. The religious when every country, every civilization, every culture, every society has some form of religious worship, chanting, uh, ritual dancing, all of these, literature, poetry, all of that, the, the, in any religious system. And the possible temporal lobes are involved for group cohesiveness. It has evolved this mechanism for religious belief, but that, that's a speculation. Short answers we don't know, but I, I made a casual remark somewhere saying the temporal lobes are involved in religious experience. Of course, some part of your brain must be involved. In the times of London, put UCSD scientists have discovered the God center in the brain, the God spot, G spot in the brain. And then this created a tremendous <laughs> publicity. People wrote to it and I said, you didn't know no such thing, I wish, you know. Uh, so the short answer is there are structures in the brain which within a hyperactive experience, religious, religious experience. That does not mean God does not exist. Obviously not. Maybe her way of manifesting herself works in strange ways. Correct. Uh, my my colleague Deepak Chopra doesn't agree with that, but that's true, yeah. Every thought has a corresponding set of neurons firing. So any uh, outer body experiences, any uh, creative experiences are all rooted in just neurons firing? That's the, that's the faith on which scientists go by. But so till now it has not failed us. You know, we have strange syndromes, we can explain, treat them. We may come, up, come, to, come to a wall someday where we say, this cannot be explained, explained by science. You know, you, you react to a, a, a beautiful painting, a Da Vinci painting or a, a bronze from South India, and you look at it, you know, and then you say, well. So you, you, can only, you can only say, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 it's so moving that there must be something beyond science. So in, intuition or things like that, like prajna, the concepts of those, obviously science doesn't take a stand on those. On, on what? Sorry, can you repeat that? The word pragya, or the concept yeah. of intuition. Yeah, but there's two, two aspects. One is your emotional reaction to it, psychological reaction to it, that can be understood by science. But whether the, there's a divine communication between you and the deity, that's a separate issue. And that, to me, is, a, is not a province of science. That's a province of bhakti and the different domain of discourse. But if it's repeatable? Is it repeatable? Well, yeah. So if it's repeatable, it doesn't fall into science still? No, but you still, you, it's repeatable in the sense you see you get a certain pattern of activity, it corresponds with that feeling of bhakti or rasa. But it doesn't explain. <laughs> but the question about, you know, experiencing God and whether it's real or not, outside the province of science. I, I'm, I, I tend to believe that there is, but I'm the minority. Does the brain invest in insulation, myelin insulation, to speed up the process? It does, obviously, because mammalian brains have insulation. Invertebrate brains, many of them don't have insulation. So, yeah, that's one of the ways in which it, it manages high-speed computation. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah, the insulation does matter, yeah. And you get myelination in MS, multiple sclerosis, 
demyelination, it causes the loss of this insulation, causes abnormal behavior and, and neurological changes, yeah. You're saying that a lot of Indian intuitive thinking in the past has generated ideas which have later turned out to be viable scientifically. Right. Yeah, well, we were clever. <laughs> sometimes you anticipate discoveries and it is probably, even in Western science, sometimes you have a hunch, you anticipate, you have a vague intuition. And the difference is you go and test it rigorously and show it's true because not all intuitions work. Nine out of 10 intuitions go through the window. To know which one is correct and conforms to nature, you have to do experiments. This is also Freudian ingenuity of some kind, and which some of which is coming right and some of it is not. Uh, no, 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 some of it is just wrong, you just got it wrong. You know. Some of, some of it you got it right and you tested it, it turns out to be right. In the anvil of science, you, know, you have to do the experiment and show that it's right. But where the intuition comes from is a very good question. That I don't know. People are still working on that, on that aspect of brain function. Uh, sir, uh, what is the exact difference between brain and, um, brain and mind? And do you believe that mind is an organ or it's a bundle of energy? And the third question is, uh, uh, what, uh, can I, uh, what is the opinion about the Bruce Lipton biology of belief? Okay, now that's a question that's 4,000 years old. 5,000 years Upanishads, there's mind and brain. You could say two things. One thing we know is studying the brain you create, you enriches your understanding of the mind. We've seen dozens of psychiatric disorders we treat, mental illness we treat. It enriches your understanding how the mind works. What the exact correlation is between brain activity and mind is, is not clear. It's debated among philosophers. Does mind cause brain? What is the na nature of the relationship? Is the mind inside the brain? It's like asking is time, when time is passing and the clock phase is moving, is, is, is the mind, is the time inside the clock? Can you answer that? Is the time inside the clock or not? You need the time for measuring the clock to measure the time. But the clock, the time is not inside the clock. So that kind of relationship might exist between Brahman or some mind and individual brains that serve as an antenna to receive that. That's just pure spe philosophical speculation. So do, does culture rewire the brain? Culture does rewire the brain, absolutely. I think that was his question. Okay, the question, does culture influence the brain tremendously? Yeah. It's a matter of terminology. You know, I think what we want to do in science, we want to understand it. When you understand it, then you can refine the terminology. Terminology should not go ahead of the, the understanding of the phenomenon. What is this about hypnotism, that somebody else influences your brain from outside? Hypnosis, okay. Now, the trouble with hypnosis is that it's clearly a valid phenomenon. You don't know what, what's going on there. We know people are suggestible. You know, somebody, if your boss tells you, go do this, you might do it. Or I might tell you to do something, you might do this. There's suggestibility. Hypnosis is one step further where your, your ability to not listen to the person is lost. You follow them blindly, you, that person's free will takes over your mind. That aspect of it cannot be nailed down for, for sure, but it's a real phenomenon, it's not been studied carefully. We don't know what causes hypnosis. But it does happen. It does happen, for sure. Yeah, it does happen. can influence the brain. Yeah, it can, yeah, that's correct. But, 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 but by talking, not by some telepathy or... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, thank you. Excellent, thank you. Yeah.